world by a very few people. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Symbolic example. I was uh, down uh, south in England, um, I don't know, two or three years ago now, and across this great um, area of, uh, it was one of these Iron Age hill fort type things, but across it was this vast herd of sheep, hundreds of them. Never seen so many sheep in one place. And it's a nice day, you know, and I'm enjoying the day. And then the farmer arrives in his pickup truck, parks it, gets out of the truck, and I, I swear to you, I don't think he even moved an eyelid. Stood there against a stick. One or two or three of the sheep immediately react to, it must have been his eyelids, I guess, I don't know, because they're going in the desired direction. Within minutes, it's like exodus. Hundreds of them are following the one in front, you know. I have got mine of my own, we did this yesterday, so we do it tomorrow, I guess we'll do it today and all that stuff. And the few stragglers, and there were remarkably few, who didn't immediately conform to what you might call that bar-bar mentality, they were given the extra dose of fear with the sheepdog. Rope, 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 all right, all right, all right, I'll go quietly. This combination of the bar-bar and the fear rounded up this vast herd of sheep in a ridiculously short time. And I stood there, and I thought, because I do from time to time, I'm looking at the human race here. This is how it's done. This is how a few can actually control the mass. Because you can't do it with tanks in the streets and soldiers at the door. There's too many people. It's like trying to physically herd sheep together. You can't do it. You'd need a, you'd need a, a man, maybe more than one, for every sheep to do it physically. You have to do it through the mind. Either through fear or through conditioning people to think the way you want them to think. So this, these hundreds of sheep were rounded up by one fella flicking his eyelids every now and again and a sheepdog dispensing fear. And that's how it's done in human terms also. It's amazing the extent to which we have given our power away, our spiritual power. When I come to the spiritual side of this, and I emphasize again, not the religious, in the second half of what I've got to say, it's all about taking our power back. Because once we do that, it's all over. The great pyramid of manipulation that I'm going to talk about tonight becomes impossible. But when we give it away, we're a doddle to manipulate. We've even given our bodies away, you know. It's funny, this. It's, apart from our mind, it's the one thing that is us. We own it. But we've given it away. Uh, brought home to me, um, I went into um, what, you know, National Health Service Hospital a little while ago with my boy, Gareth, who plays football. And um, he's hurt himself playing football, hurt his hand, you see. So we go, in, we go down the casualty unit to... Um, see if he's cracked the bone or something. So we go in this little cubicle thing and this young doctor comes in, nice chap, and he pulls his hand around, you know, and he says, uh, no, he says, um, it's not broken. He says, best thing for that is Arnica. Now I've nearly fallen off the bench here. <laughs> this National Health Hospital doctor is recommending this homeopathic type remedy. So I said, um, what do the authorities say about you recommending this then? He says, I don't tell them. He said, and he pulls two little bottles out of his pocket like, <coughs> and he said, um, people come to this casualty unit, he says, they're usually traumatized because of what's happened to them. He says, I put two little drops of this on their tongue, calms them down. Rescue remedy, I guess. He said, you know those nurses out in that casualty area, he said, I'm, I treat them homeopathically, he said, but I can't treat the patients except on the quiet. Same in America, same in these other areas of the world where they have the same basic system, which is to tell us what we do and don't do with our bodies and how we treat them and how we don't treat them. Because when I was sitting in that unit, that casualty unit with that young doctor, I thought, how many people contribute their money 
to fund the National Health Service or the Human Debris Processing Unit, which it's fast become, to make it possible for it to continue. Millions and millions of people do that. Every week, every month, they fund the thing. How many people decide that for that money, we will not be offered the great spectrum of healing knowledge going back to antiquity, we will actually be given, in effect, the choice between the scalpel and the drug, which just happen to make vast amounts of money for multinational drug companies, who make their literally billions in profits, not from health, but from disease. How many people decide that? A relative handful. All of them probably linked into the multinational drug company network. It's a great scam, you know. If you control the World Health Organization, mm. you make sure there are statements that the World Health Organization says there's going to be a measles epidemic next year. Get vaccinated. Get your children vaccinated. You're a bad parent if you don't. Then the same people that organize that then start flogging out the vaccine and make a fortune out of it. It's one of the things that um, I think uh, opens up so much to what's really going on in the world is when we realize that the same force controls apparently different organizations. So this um, uh, giving our mind away, giving our power away, has actually created the vehicle for the few to control the world. And that vehicle is overwhelmingly what I call hassle-free zones, call them comfort zones as well. Every dogma, Christian dogma, uh, Islamic dogma, Jewish dogma, economic dogma, political dogma, crikey, you could stay here all night. We're, we're, we're a dogma production line, the human race. Each of those dogmas and societies in general are all hassle-free zones. By that I mean there is a very narrow area of acceptable thought and behavior, the norm, which, if you conform to it, you're left alone. You're hassle-free. No one calls you mad. No one calls you dangerous. No one gives you a hard time for the crime of being different, if you conform. If you start to think, well, actually, you know, I've got a mind of my own, and it's a unique mind, and therefore I'm going to have my unique truth and my unique view of me and life and everything. You start to get very dangerously close to the edge of the hassle-free zone, and eventually, if you keep going, you step outside of it. At that point, he's mad, he is. She's, what strange she is. He's dangerous, he is. Oh. And most people don't want that hassle. They don't want to be treated like that. So most people, even if they put their toe out there, go, oh my goodness, I'm staying in here, it's flipping hassle out there. So what happens? The mass comes up. You know, you go down any rush hour in any city in the world, London, New York, Sydney, anywhere, and you see all those hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people coming past in the street, they're not projecting to the world what they really are what they really feel, what they really want to do with their lives, they've got a mask. And it's a mask that says, this is not really me, but this is what I think is acceptable to everyone else, so I can occupy the hassle-free zone. And for, for me, anyway, it's that war in the psyche between that part of us that I call I am me, I am free, that wants to flow with our uniqueness. The war between that and the part of our psyche I call, oh my God, which is at the heart of emotional, mental, and therefore physical dis-ease in the world. And what it's also created is a mass schizophrenia. Because not only are we slaves to impose thought and behavior as a human race, we're also the police force of all the other slaves. And hilarious, really. When you're on the edge of the hassle-free zone and you are thinking, if I go any further in what I say and do, even though I think it's right, I'm going to meet hassle for being different. 
You're not standing there thinking, if I do go any further, what will Bill Clinton think of me? What, what, about, what about the Prime Minister of Britain? What will he say? Uh, and the Governor of the Bank of England? Uh, we're not saying that. What we're saying at that point, shall I, shan't I express my uniqueness and evacuate hassle-free zone, we're saying, what will my mother think? What about the neighbours? Oh, what about the blokes down the pub? Oh my God! In other words, what will the other slaves to impose thought and behaviour think about me escaping from it? We police each other. It's like having um, a cell full of prisoners and, and once one of the prisoners finds a means of escape, it's all the other prisoners that run to block the exit. We are both the slaves, the prisoners to this imposition and the police force of it because everyone seems to be trying to tell everyone else what is right and wrong, what is moral and immoral, what's right for them, what they should do, what they must do, what they ought to do. And as a result of that, we're actually manipulating each other without realizing it. And within this hassle-free zone, <sighs> tremendous uh, manipulation and indoctrination goes on. This hassle-free zone you could describe as the public arena. And if you look at the media, what is the media? The media is the collective police force of the hassle-free zone for anyone who steps out of it in public. People think, you know, when you say the media is controlled and the media is part of this manipulation, that you must therefore be saying that there is a manipulator in every newsroom all over the world standing behind journalists saying, no, no, can't write that, you've changed that, this is what I'm telling you, you write that, okay, that's fine. You don't need all that. Once the structure, the mindset is there, then the media just does it without manipulation, although there are key people like media owners and stuff that are certainly kind of involved in what I'm going to talk about tonight, but in general, what does the media do? It defends and uses as its point of reference from which it judges everyone and everything the norm in society. In other words, what the hassle-free zone says is reality. Example, a few centuries ago, if we'd have had today's media, they would have dismissed as mad or condemned as bad anyone who said the earth was a sphere, was round because the hassle-free zones version of reality at that time was that it was flat. Once that uh, reality flipped through weight of evidence and the hassle-free zone norm became the earth is actually a sphere, suddenly anyone who said the earth was flat was now off their rocker. So anyone, at any time, in the public eye, who says or acts in ways that are outside of society's norm at that time, is immediately jumped on by the media as mad or bad, because their reference point for sanity and reality is whatever the norm is. And there are, there are several key mind manipulation techniques which um, are very, very powerful uh, propaganda tools. The most effective and the most powerful, and it's used on us all the time, is something I call problem-reaction-solution. It's a cracker, this one. It's a mind manipulation technique that avoids not only opposition to what is the goal of the manipulators, it actually manipulates people to demand they do what they want to do anyway. And it's happening all the time. I, once you see this technique and how it works, you watch the news and read the newspapers in a completely different light because you start to see it happening. It works like this. 
you start by secretly creating a problem in the world and making sure someone else is blamed for it in the public uh, arena, in the public mind. It could be a run on a currency, it could be a government collapse, at its most extreme it could be a war, because the two world wars in this century were funded, all sides were funded by the same people. Provable. The same people that funded the Allies in the Second World War and funded uh, the Soviet Union also funded Hitler through loans from America known as the Young Plan and the Doors Plan and also via the German subsidiaries of American multinational companies. Why would they do that? Why would someone want to fund all sides in a war? What is good is a war? Well, first of all, on one level, it makes vast amounts of money if you're lending money to all sides and you're also um, selling them lots of arms and all that stuff. But the fundamental reason for a war is to change the nature of post-war society. And what we saw in the First World War and the Second World War were massive global examples of problem-reaction-solution, which work like this. The problems created secretly. You then use the media, which isn't difficult, to wind up public opinion in relation to your manufactured problem to the point where public opinion utters the classic words, something must be done, this can't go on, which is always, always followed by, give my power away, what are they going to do about it? And at that point, those who created the problem and got someone else to be blamed for it, wound up that public reaction, then openly, in the public arena, in the parliaments of the world, uh, on the, in the newspapers and on the television, offer the solutions to the problems they have created. And in doing so, they get vast numbers of people to demand what they want to do anyway. Uh, for instance, if, um, if you want more cameras in the streets. Crikey, they're going up all over the place in Britain. If you want more cameras in the streets, you want a more armed police force, you want more authoritarian laws, greater erosions of freedom, and you want the public to demand you do it, then get the public frightened of crime. Either let um, society break down so there is more crime, or emphasize crime to be worse than it really is in some areas. Get people frightened, and the first thing people do when they're in fear about something is they look for someone out there to protect them from what they're frightened of. So, get people frightened that they're going to be burgled, get people frightened they're going to be mugged in the street, and they'll demand you take the freedoms away. They'll demand cameras in the streets and more authoritarian laws. I, was, uh, I turned on the BBC radio, Radio 5, uh, last year, and they had an item on cameras in the streets, because they're going up everywhere, these things, you know. You want money for homeless people? Oh, the economy's not too good, you know, you know. You have to wait for these things. You want cameras in the street? They'll write the cheque. And this guy, he was from a council in uh, East Anglia, Norfolk, I reckon. And he said, um, to be honest, he said, um, crime rates in our area don't justify cameras in the streets. He said, but our people think they do, so we're putting them up to make them feel better. Problem, reaction, solution. And we have a very topical example of that in the last few years. Bosnia. The goal of this manipulation, and has been for a very long time, is to get the world population, or that, majority of it anyway, to see as a good idea or the only option in given circumstances, circumstances that are manipulated into place, the creation of a one world government to which nation states would be principalities, administrative units, a world central bank which would administer all financial transactions on the planet, a world currency which wouldn't be coins and notes, it would be merely electronic, cashless society, for which there are fundamental implications for freedom, as we'll see as we go along tonight. A world army under centralized control, with nation-state uh, armies uh, dismantled under the uh, justification of seeking peace, and a microchipped population linked to a global computer, the latter of which sounds bizarre to many people on first hearing, except that we are ridiculously close to it and the technology already exists. So if we take one element of that under problem, reaction, solution, the world army, and relate it to Bosnia, 
Under this mind manipulation technique, the last thing you want is for the status quo in Bosnia, whatever it is, to be working. Because then you haven't got a problem and you're in real trouble. So, you make sure the United Nations peacekeeping operation is not only um, shown globally to be ineffective, it's actually severely embarrassed. Problem. The more horrific pictures come out of Bosnia, and my goodness me, they have over the last few years, understandably, the louder comes the public and political reaction. Something must be done. This can't go on. What are they going to do about it? And what has been the solution? A 60,000 strong world army under centralized control, the biggest multinational force assembled on this planet since the Second World War. Exactly what the manipulation requires. And later I'll put forward some more evidence to suggest that that is exactly what the goal of Bosnia is. Starting a war is a doddle. You know, there's no one in this room, I would say, that wants a fight tonight. Okay, fine. But I could go into this audience, and I could start a fight with somebody. They would defend themselves. Other people in the audience would come to help them out. Suddenly, an audience that does not want a fight would be chaos. With fists and hands and arms everywhere. Take that to the global level with armies and starting a war as a doddle. To keep the war going, you need money. Same people control the money. To keep the war going, you need arms. Same people control the arms. The way that this can be done uh, with a very few people, at the peak, that is, is because if you look at every organization today, be it uh, a university, a school, a government, a secret society, anything, a multinational company, business of any kind, they're structured as a pyramid. The pyramid is the structure of society today. I believe that we're actually moving in this spiritual awakening that's going on now from the pyramid to the circle, which is a very, very different way of people contributing to society. But at the moment we have the hierarchy, the pyramid, which works like this. In any organization, uh, you've got a very, very few people at the peak of the pyramid. That very few people know exactly what that organization's about, what its real agenda is, what it's really trying to achieve. The further you come down from that peak in any organization, you're meeting more and more and more people who know less and less and less and less about what the organization's really about. They only know their part. The CIA call this compartmentalization, keeping from everyone else in the pyramid how what they're doing in apparent innocence links in with what other people are doing in apparent innocence to produce a very sinister pattern. I was talking to a guy <laughs> who worked for 20 years at the listening station at Cheltenham, GCHQ. And he was telling me that um, that building is actually structured under this process of compartmentalization. If you work at GCHQ, you have an electronic uh, card which only gets you in that part of the building where you work. You can't get anywhere else. So the only people in GCHQ who know everything that's coming in, how it fits together and what's really going on, what the real pattern is, is the very, very few people at the top. This is how it works all along. The Freemasons are a classic example of this. Uh, when you say um, that the Freemason secret society is involved, uh, people think that you must be saying that every Freemason wants to manipulate the world to global dictatorship. Utterly ridiculous. Of course they don't. But if you, if you look at the Freemason structure, the vast overwhelming majority of Freemasons in the world, you know the ones that go down the local lodge and roll their trouser leg up and show their left thing or whatever, you know. <coughs> Strange. I've always wanted to do that. It'd be a bit of fun. Um, <laughs> they never get higher than the bottom three levels of degree, the overwhelming majority. But in the Scottish rite of Freemasonry, which pervades much of world politics, particularly in America and other areas, there's another 30 degrees above that to the 33rd degree, which the vast majority of Freemasons never get near. And there's another 13 levels not officially accepted to exist, which some people call Illuminati degrees, which at that level, the Freemason secret society is in a different universe 
to the part where the vast majority of Freemasons exist, right down here. Compartmentalization. This is how it works. So every one of these institutions that control the direction of the world and our daily lives is a pyramid. The banking system is a pyramid. You go into the local bank, the person you meet across the counter won't even know what's going on in the bank manager's office behind them, let alone what's going on at board level and, and higher. I met a guy um, only last weekend who'd been um, in the bank, he's retired now, but he worked for a big um, British bank and he, he worked to a very, very high level in it. And he heard me speak and he came up to me afterwards and he said, you know, it's right, you know. He said, because I got very, very high in this bank, but there is an echelon above where I got that no one can get unless they are chosen by this elite few. So the banking system is a pyramid going to a peak. The intelligence agency network in the world is a pyramid going to a peak. At that peak, all the major um, intelligence agencies, British intelligence, Mossad, the CIA, all these around the world, they're the same organization. Not here, but here they are. The multinational company network is a pyramid. So is the global media and so on. And there is a global pyramid within which all these work, in which the peaks of all these individual pyramids, banking, uh, business, media, etc., fuse into one peak. And up there, it's speculated by many people, there perhaps may be no more than 13 families, 13 people at the peak, pervading down through these different levels, the same basic policy, which is pushing the world towards more and more centralization of power. And within this global pyramid are a series of organizations which, from my experience anyway, most journalists will never have heard of. But working together, they form the core of the secret government of the world. And this is operating well above the level of the Clintons and the Majors and the Coles and so on. Indeed, they are manipulating events to make sure that their people get in to positions of power. There is this like cozy little <coughs> myth that is perpetuated between politicians and the media. Politicians walk the world stage as if they are the final arbiters of power in the world. So when a president speaks, the cameras run and it's flashed around the world, prime ministers and such like. The media report the world as if presidents and prime ministers are the final arbiters and decision makers in the world. Which means that the people above the level of presidents and prime ministers that really make the decisions, they're never looked at or exposed by the mainstream media because they're not accepted to exist. And yet, who decides who becomes president of the United States? Or even runs for president? Those who control the money, cuckoo land it is to run for president, and those who control the media. Same people control both. But they decide not only who uh, runs for the Republicans, they decide who runs for the Democrats as well. And so it is around the world. This group of organizations began to be created after the establishment of a secret society in Britain, because Britain's been a real center for this. A secret society called the Round Table, involving a guy called Cecil Rhodes, after which Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, was named. In 1919, the Versailles Peace Conference, the American members of this Roundtable Secret Society, who just happened to be, merely coincidental of course, the main players behind the um, American government that went in and fought the First World War, met at the Hotel Majestic in Paris with the British members of this secret society, which, yet another coincidence, just happened to be the key members of the British War Cabinet in the First World War. And they decided to start to create offshoot organizations which, working together, would constitute the secret government of the world, or a big chunk of it. 
The first of these organizations was set up in London in 1920 called the Royal Institute of International Affairs, also known as Chatham House. Again, these organizations are pyramids with most people involved in them not realizing the real agenda. And all these organizations are projected at the world as this, uh, this term that's emerged over the last 20 years, think tanks, debating organizations. In 1921 came the next in these organizations, the American version of the Royal Institute was known as the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, since 1921, virtually every president of the United States has been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. The Royal Institute of International Affairs works to control um, British domestic and particularly foreign policy no matter who's in, Labour or Conservative, same, same people run the show, which is becoming more and more obvious. And the Council on Foreign Relations in America is there to control and manipulate American, particularly foreign policy, but other policies also. After the Second World War, when we had more centralization of power, because we've had two wars in this century now, something must be done, this can't go on, what are they going to do about it? After the First World War, the world was more centralized in terms of power. After the Second World War, it was even more centralized. That was the game. That was the idea, the goal. 1954 came an organization which today is, is probably the key organization in this network called the Bilderberg Group. Bilderberg Group met officially for the first time in 1954 at the Bilderberg Hotel in Oosterbeck, Holland. Um, under the chairmanship of a member of the Dutch royal family called Prince Bernhard, who has an interesting CV. He was, uh, according to many published works, a member of the SS before the war, worked for um, German intelligence during the war, and then became a major shareholder of Shell Oil after the war. The present chairman of the Bilderberg Group is Lord Carrington, former British cabinet minister and foreign secretary when the mistakes were made that led to the Falklands War. He resigned as the result of those mistakes and was given the job as Secretary General of NATO. Nice work if you can get it. Lord Carrington and his um, buddy, Henry Kissinger, um, come up everywhere. They are two of the super gophers of this manipulation. They're not um, top of the pyramid people, necessarily, though Kissinger is, is up there. They are people who go around manipulating into place the policies decided, playing one off against the other and such like. The Bilderberg Group, like all these others I talk about, have among their number the top people, and I mean the top people, in global politics. Not Fred Jones, MP, MP for, you know, Margate East or something. Prime Ministerial, Presidential, Ministerial and um, Leader of the Opposition level, I'm talking about the top people in global banking, the top people in the global multinational company network, in the global military, the Secretary General of NATO is always there indeed, it's a Bilderberg appointment, that, um, that post. The top people in the global media. The Bilderberg Group has a, a steering committee which meets all the time, monthly, usually in Britain, to uh, discuss policy and keep this program going of centralization of power towards world government and stuff, which incidentally the European Union is a stepping stone towards. And then once a year, it meets somewhere in the world um, in very strict secrecy and has a big conflab with loads and loads of people from around the world coming in. They try very hard even to keep um, quiet where they're meeting, never mind what they're actually discussing. And I um, had a a series of amazing coincidences when I was writing the book and the truth shall set you free for reasons I'll talk about when I come to the spiritual which put me in the right place at the right time to see things happen or um, gather information and one of those things happened in relation to the Bilderberg group last June um, I was uh, invited to stay with a school teacher friend of mine in um, Switzerland the trip had been arranged for about six to nine months. The tickets had been organized. It was all set a long time in advance. About five days before I left for Switzerland, I got um, a letter, a kind of round-robin letter 
from a journalist in America who uh, works for an alternative newspaper and has dedicated his life, in effect, to chasing these organizations, particularly the Bilderberg Group, finding out who's involved, what the agenda is, what they're trying to achieve and stuff. And even he, who does it full time, often only finds out where they're meeting very late in the day. So I get this letter and it said, I've found where the Bilderbergers are meeting this year. It's in Bergenstock, Switzerland. And it happened to be just down the road from where I was staying at the time I was staying there. Thank you, universe. So I turn up. It's three hotels, three quarters of the way up this mountain at Bergenstock. Thousand dollar a night suites. I had a bag of sherbet lemons, as I recall. <laughs> the park, the grand, and the palace. And it's like summing out a James Bond. I expected, you know, the car chase to come past me any minute, that kind of atmosphere. Mercedes everywhere. And why is it, I wonder, that whenever there's Mercedes around, there's people like that, with shoulders like that, and big double-breasted suits like, and whether they've got bad memories, I don't, I don't know, but they've got little name tags on them, you know was obviously something was going on and <laughs> being organized. So I enjoy the atmosphere for a while. I think it's very strange. And I leave. And then I come back on the last of the four days they met. What a difference. Now I can't get on the mountain leading up to the hotels because the road is blocked by the Swiss police right at the bottom of the mountain. Across the mountain are military lookout posts. According to this journalist, in the early days, there were helicopters all over the mountain um, surveying the place. This is a private meeting of a private organization attended by many, many of the people we see on the news and in the newspapers every week and actually have the opportunity to vote for in this democracy that we're supposed to live in. Incidentally, one of the great myths uh, I feel we need to get over is the fact that democracy is freedom. No, it's not. It's a con trick. Fifty people telling 49 what's going to happen in their lives is not freedom. Or, or in our electoral system in Britain, about 35 telling the rest what's going to happen is certainly not freedom. But freedom and democracy have become interlinked, so one means the other, so we're in a democracy, we are free, so we accept it when we're actually in a tyranny. Anyway, I thought I'd play the ignorant tourist in Bergenstock, see, which I did with remarkable aplomb. So I come up to the roadblock light, and this Swiss policeman comes over. I knew he was a Swiss policeman, because on his back it said Swiss police. You know, my observation is, my, my powers of observation are unbelievable that day. This is a nice man I'm talking to here, spoke very good English. And um, I said to him, look, I said, um, I came here the other day and I, w I went up, the, the, what's the problem today? It was very obvious he didn't know exactly what was going on, but I remember what he said. He said, it's top secret, top secret, no one up there before five o'clock, after that you'll be able to go back to the hotels. Last day it was. Two things uh, occurred to me. One was the irony that I could have told this guy what was going on up there. Many of the people that were up there, because they're always there, Lord Carrington, Henry Kissinger, David Rockefeller um, of the Rockefeller Empire, which is fundamentally involved in all this. Representatives of the House of Rothschild, also fundamentally involved in this. And many of the other um, key people, uh, like uh, Agnelli, the head of Fiat, and people like that. The big players in the world, banking, political, and uh, business network. The other thing that occurred to me is that I was looking into this policeman's eyes and I was looking at compartmentalization. Because as I say, this was a nice man. He probably had children and grandchildren. He doesn't want to leave them some global tyranny. But he doesn't know what he's defending. What has he been told? Top secret meeting, no one passed here till you're told. That's all he knows. So although he doesn't want to leave um, his children, what not all of the people up there, because some of them are manipulated too, but what the core of that organization wants to leave his children, he doesn't want to. But he doesn't know what he's defending. So on that one afternoon, he's keeping from the public eye some of the people that wish to leave his children exactly that. 
We had a situation in, uh, in Bergenstock where the secrecy was so uh, fierce for a private organization, a think tank, that they brought them in by private plane to a, <coughs> a military airfield at the bottom of the, uh, the mountain and then flew them behind the security cordon in helicopters. Didn't even drive them up there. And it's amazing how if you if your attitude turns out to be the right attitude for the people that control that organization how your career can soar after you're invited to these conflaps in the 1970s um, certainly outside of Britain a virtually unknown very little known conservative opposition spokesman called Margaret Thatcher started being invited to some Bilderberg meetings. She goes on to be not only leader of the Conservative Party, but leader of Britain, Prime Minister, right through the 1980s when fundamental changes were happening to British society through something called Thatcherism. Interestingly, on the other side of the Atlantic, at the same time, purely by coincidence, of course, we had Reaganomics which just happened to be the same economic policies. Isn't life funny, all these coincidences? It couldn't just be that the same people made sure both were in power at the same time, because that economics uh, was exactly what was required through the 80s as part of this plan for centralization on a global level. In 1991, uh, even in America, a virtually unknown governor for Arkansas called Bill Clinton was invited to the Bilderberg meeting in Baden-Baden, Germany. Within a year, this guy is successfully running for President of the United States. 1993, another relatively unknown Labour Party Home Affairs spokesman in Britain called Tony Blair was invited to the Bilderberg meeting in Greece, along with his opponent, the Conservative Chancellor, Kenneth Clark, by the way. Within a year, Tony Blair is leader of the Labour Party and, barring a miracle, will become Prime Minister of this country. It's a great career move. The last five Secretary Generals of NATO, and I only know it's the last five because that's only as far as I've had time to check back, it's many more than that. The last five Secretary Generals of NATO, Bilderbergs, group members Manfred Werner Joseph Lunds Lord Carrington Willie Clace the present one um, Javier Solana Bilderberger and indeed when they were discussing who was going to be the new Secretary General of NATO it was between three people Javier Solana, Bilderberg Group, Uwe Elleman Jensen of Denmark, Bilderberg Group, and Rude Lubbers, the former Dutch Prime Minister, Bilderberg Group. The head of the World Bank and many of his predecessors, James Wolfenson, the World Bank whose investment policies in what we call the Third World have created human and environmental mayhem for, for decades, Bilderberg members. And one of the big Bilderberg policies since 1954, indeed before, 54 was when it became official, has been, wait for it, the creation of a European superstate with one central bank, one currency, centralization of political power, and encompassing the former Soviet Union. Who is the biggest voice in Europe today saying we must not fall behind uh, the time uh, scale for the central bank and the currency in Europe? Chancellor Kohl of Germany, long-term Bilderberger, as were many of his predecessors as Chancellor of Germany. Who took us into Europe? Edward Heath, Bilderberger. Who supported him from the Labour side? Harold Wilson, Bilderberger. Roy Jenkins, Bilderberger. Dennis Healy, long-term Bilderberger. Was at the first meeting in 1954. 
Who supported um, going into Europe and staying in Europe from the liberal, the third party perspective? Joe Grimman, Bilderberger, David Steele, Bilderberger, Paddy Ashdown, Bilderberger. The key posts that m control decision making, which pushes further and further towards centralization of power, all or most of which, increasingly all, are peopled by members of these organizations. Now this may be a magnificent coincidence, or it may be that we need to know what's really going on in front of our eyes here. Uh, the last of these organizations I'll mention briefly is called the Trilateral Commission. Because of its um, name, as its name would suggest, it's there to coordinate the same manipulation between three parts of the world, America, Europe, Japan. It was set up in 1972-73 by David Rockefeller, one of the key men behind the Bilderberg Group and the Council on Foreign Relations and a guy called Brzezinski, university guy, was in the Carter administration. And the Carter administration is very relevant here because the Trilateral Commission is a very good example of how you can manipulate events with all these organizations working as one because many people are actually members of a number of them at the same time. The goal, the first goal of the Trilateral Commission in 72-73 was to put one of its members in the White House as President of the United States as soon as possible. It managed it at the next election when Jimmy Carter became President of the United States. The Carter administration was like a who's who sports and social club annual outing of the Trilateral Commission, an organization that had been going for about three or four years at the time. Uh, Walter Mondale, Vice President, Trilateral Commission. Secretary of State Cyrus Vance, Trilateral Commission. National Security Advisor, a key post in America, this guy Brzezinski, who actually helped to set up the Trilateral Commission. And from there downwards, the Carter administration was awash with members of the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, because we have choice, because we live in the land of the free, people then replaced the Democratic Carter administration with the Republican Reagan-Bush administrations, which were also awash with members of the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. And then the Republicans were replaced by the Democrats, because we have free elections. And Clinton Democratic administration is awash with members of the Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. I'll tell you what it's like. In, um, in the high streets of Britain, there are two electrical retailers called Curry's and their opponents, Dixon's. So, some people go into Dixon's and they say, I had a bad, I had a bad time at Dixon's, you know, I, I don't like them. I'm going to go to Curry's and give them my money, I am. They're owned by the same people. These, the two major um, roadside uh, restaurants in Britain, Happy Eaters and Little Chefs, owned by the same people. The competition is actually an illusion. Different name above the shop front, same people with their hands on the wheel. That's what happens in global politics. Why? you might understandably ask, aren't we told about this by the global media? Why aren't we told about these meetings which the alternative media can find out about with difficulty, but they can, and the common themes between people who are in the major positions in the world? How people from apparently different sides in politics who argue in public are actually attending the same meetings of organizations with a proven agenda of world government, world central bank, world army, world currency, microchip population. I offer this as a possibility. Maybe, just maybe, we don't hear about the Bilderberg Group and its attendees in Telegraph newspapers in Britain 
because Telegraph newspapers are owned by something called the Hollinger Group, which is owned by a man called Conrad Black, steering committee member of the Bilderberg Group. Incidentally, two of the people on his board of directors are Henry Kissinger and Lord Carrington. Maybe we don't hear about any of these organizations and their agenda. In Rupert Murdoch's News International in Britain, which owns stream of newspapers and uh, Sky Television, very much involved with the course, because the former executive chairman of News International and still a board member is a guy called Andrew Knight, core steering committee member of the Bilderberg Group. Maybe in America they don't hear about any of these organizations in one of their most influential newspapers, the Washington Post, because the Washington Post and a great long stream of other organizations and um, publications are actually owned by Catherine Graham, who's owned uh, the Washington Post going back to Watergate and beyond, where they were very much involved, of course, in removing Nixon, because Catherine Graham is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, and the Trilateral Commission. Key uh, members within the hierarchy of the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, and a stream of other major publications all around the world are controlled or owned by members of these organizations. None of them ever mentioned them. Isn't that funny? So what we're looking at here are organizations within organizations. So um, while apparently people in the banking system here appear to be isolated from the political system here and the media here, actually there is one central organization which actually manipulates and coordinates a policy among all these apparently unconnected institutions of the world. Which kind of brings us back to Bosnia. I believe passionately that Bosnia is a horrific case of problem, reaction, solution, bringing into being, or very much closer, the establishment, the precedent established of a world army. Interesting, therefore, to look at the major peace negotiators in Bosnia appointed since that horrific conflict began. The first European Union peace negotiator appointed was Lord Carrington, President of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, Chairman of the Bilderberg Group, member of the Trilateral Commission. He was replaced as European Union peace negotiator by Lord David Owen, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, who was replaced by Carl Bildt, former Swedish Prime Minister, Bilderberg Group. At the same time that they were working on behalf of the European Union in Bosnia, the United Nations peace negotiators who were working with them, very close with them all the time, were Cyrus Vance, Bilderberg Group, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, and he was replaced by a Norwegian, Thorvald Stoltenberg, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission. When they failed to achieve peace, out of the blue, amid worldwide publicity, came an independent peace negotiator, Jimmy Carter, first Trilateral Commission President of the United States, Council on Foreign Relations member. Then came the group of people who negotiated the so-called Dayton Agreement, which led to the World Army situation. These were Bill Clinton's peace envoy, Richard Holbrook, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations. He answered to the Secretary of State, Warren Christopher, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, who answered to Bill Clinton, Bilderberg Group, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission. The World Army in Bosnia is now commanded by Admiral Leighton Smith, Council on Foreign Relations, and the civilian part of its operation is headed by Carl Bildt, Bilderberg Group. 
we are looking at a gigantic contract before our eyes. We don't live in a democracy in this country or in America and these other places. We live in a one-party state where the same force from the peak of the pyramid string pulls all sides. A few years ago, they had a democratic election in America. And what appeared to happen was that George Bush, Republican, was replaced by Bill Clinton, Democrat. But what actually happened? George Bush, Council on Foreign Relations, Trilateral Commission, 33rd degree Freemason, funded by the Rockefellers, was replaced by Bill Clinton, Democrat, Council on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, 33rd degree Freemason, funded by the Rockefellers. We're free, honey. Play the national anthem. One party state. Different names above the shop fronts, same people control whatever. Which is why, as we all say all the time, it doesn't matter who you get in, they still do the same. Of course they do. Of course the same people are string pulling the whole show. Nothing for me uh, sums up the scale to which we have conceded our power to control our own lives than the world financial system. I love this one, me. Now, one of the great diversion techniques that's used upon us is to make very simple things, which the world financial system is, sound ever so complicated. So what we have, we have um, almost every night on the news, we have... Um, Economists wheeled in front of television cameras, surrounded by computer screens, talking in a language we don't understand. I think it's the Chancellor's M3 policy. I thought the M3 was a motorway. I don't know, something to do with money, apparently. I don't know. It's the public sector borrowing requirement. And so they go on. Oh, God, it's boring. What's on the other side? You know? And so we switch off, understandably. And yet, the world financial system is as simple as can be. It can be summed up in one short sentence. You lend people money that doesn't exist and you charge them interest on it. That's it. Everything else comes out of that. This world is up to its neck in debt on money that has never, does not, and will never exist. And we stand for this. And the great prison that the human race lives in, as I'll come to in more detail when I look at the spiritual reactions to this, is the fear of what other people think of them. That's the prison we live in. That's the great limiter of our potential. Alongside that, when you ask people, why aren't you really doing what you really want to do with your life? Invariably they say, because I've got to pay the mortgage, mate. Understandable. So, the more you can get people, businesses and governments in debt, the more you can artificially inflate the cost of the basics of life, the more you are pressurizing people to serve your system, be a robot and a clone of it, so that they can earn the money to pay for the basics of life. This is why the world financial system has been designed as a prison. Banks are lending, as a matter of course, £10,000 and more for every £1,000 they actually have deposited. If everyone went to the banks tomorrow and took out what they theoretically have deposited there, the banks would be bankrupt so many times it'd be in the Guinness Book of Records. They haven't got it. So when we take out a loan... <laughs> Oh, please tell me, Mother, this is not true. <laughs> they type in to your account the amount you flipping loaned. That's all they do. From that moment, you start paying interest on money that doesn't exist. 
People say, why is the American government trillions and trillions of dollars in debt? Ridiculous. How could it possibly do that? Very simple when you see how it works. And this is how it works around the world as well. Um, one transaction in one day in America. The American government wants to borrow, say, a billion dollars more than it's actually taken in taxation. Now it's the government. It could actually print its own money interest-free if it chose to, but of course if it did that, you're removing massive amounts of power from the global banking system, which is controlled by the same people that decide who's going to be president of the United States. So they don't print their own money interest-free. They issue an IOU to a cartel of private banks known laughably as the Central Bank of America, known as the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System is supposed to be the Central Bank of America, it is a cartel of private banks. The present head of the Federal Reserve is Alan Greenspan, Bilderberg Group Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations, who took over from Paul Volcker, who was there at the time of Reaganomics and Thatcherism, Paul Volcker, Bilderberg Group Trilateral Commission Council on Foreign Relations. You get the picture. So, they issued the government an IOU to this cartel of private banks for a billion dollars. The banks then type into the government's account a billion dollars. That's all they've done. From that moment on, the American taxpayer, via the government, starts paying interest on a billion dollars. Not only that, this IOU is now legally counted as an asset of the banks as if they had a billion dollars in their hands. So now they can lend another ten billion dollars to anyone else that wants to borrow it, on the basis of this non-existent money. Now they're lending and getting interest on 11 billion dollars, not one cent of which has ever or will ever exist. And we stand for this. I hear people arguing that, oh God, it's got to be like this or the, well, the system would collapse. Good. <laughs> Good. Hey, this prison wall's coming down. Get the, get, the, get, the, get the bricks out, you know. A few repairs, you know. I might be getting out of prison here. Perish the thought here. Now, this is um, not just uh, naval contemplation. This is very, very important to our everyday lives. Gus, if you take one um, product, say a food product, um, and you look at how this system affects uh, the price of it, the farmer growing the food in the field to start with will be borrowing money that doesn't exist and paying interest on it. So the price he charges will have to reflect the fact that he's got to do that. So in effect, what he does costs more. Same with the transport company from the farm to the factory. Now the factory that's processing the food will be um, no doubt borrowing vast amounts of money that doesn't exist and paying interest on it and its cost and its price will reflect that. Same with the transport from the factory to the shop, same with the shop. So by the time we put our hand up on the shelf and pull the product off, the cost of that product is massively inflated compared with what it needs to be because everyone along the line in its production is having to add a little bit to pay interest on money that doesn't exist. Wake me up. This is why we buy three houses to live in one. We do this. I went up um, into the National Westminster Bank in Durham, the north of England last year, and I got one of their mortgage leaflets. There it was in black and white. If I take out a loan to buy a house from the National Westminster Bank of £50,000, I will pay them back £152,000. I will buy three houses for the privilege of living in one and my mortgage payments will reflect that therefore the pressure for me to serve the system to earn the money to service that debt will be greater and what did it say on this leaflet the national westminster bank we're here to make life easier <laughs> great question that I found anyway, because all this is flipping opened up to me in the last few years. I didn't come out of the womb saying I, I know it all. I, you know, I can see what's going on. It's just information that's opened my eyes in the last few years. Um, and one of the questions that I've realized um, opens up so much, it's a very simple one. Who benefits? 
Who benefits, for instance, from, from me accepting the version of events about the Oklahoma bombing and many other things that various media organizations and official governments and stuff are telling me um, is the right version of events? Who benefits? Well, who benefited from the Oklahoma bombing? Anyone who'd want to centralize um, uh, more, more power in the uh, law enforcement agencies in America certainly has benefited from that. And as Bill Clinton said 24 hours afterwards, uh, we must have an easing of restrictions of the, uh, on the military's involvement in domestic law enforcement. Problem, reaction, solution. And there's so much about that Oklahoma bomb that has never come to light publicly in the main arena that I've seen. And I tell you, the government version of events is a farce and a complete um, lie. Anyway, who benefits from us buying three houses to live in one? Another part of that question. Well, say the house costs £60,000. The builder who actually creates the thing and makes it a reality, he don't benefit from me buying three. He's paid out the sixty grand. he has paid out on me buying one. The guy who um, produces the materials to the builder so he can build the house, he's paid out the 60 grand. Everyone who actually creates the house is paid out of me buying one. One person and one person alone benefits from us buying three houses, sometimes more, to live in one, and that's the guy who's lending us money that doesn't exist and charging us interest on it. And we stand for this. And a few people can't control the direction of the world. Well, we'll give our power away to this extent. It's a doddle. Interestingly, two presidents of the United States uh, in the history of that country have suggested and in some small way begun to introduce interest-free money that wasn't borrowed from the banking cartels and interest paid on it. Those two presidents were Abraham Lincoln and John F. Kennedy. They have one other thing in common, you might recall. But perhaps the most grotesque aspect of this whole nonsense of interest on money is what we call third world debt. Third world debt has crucified vast tracts of our fellow humanity and continues to do minute by minute. The third world debt is debt on money that has never, does not, and will never exist. Last time I saw the figures, around 400,000 children in Brazil died from hunger-related disease every year. And at the time I saw those figures, Brazil was the second biggest exporter of food in the world. And the money received from that export great chunks of it were servicing interest on money that has never existed. And as one Brazilian official I was reading about recently um, said, most of the money that constitutes the Brazilian debt never left the computer systems of Wall Street. My God, it's time for a turning of the tide. Why can't governments print their own money interest-free and lend it to people interest-free so we buy one house to live in one house instead of three? So we don't have to inflate the price of everything because everyone's got a service interest on money that doesn't exist. Why? Because it's possible. The will is not there. And why is it that no political party that I've come across anywhere in the world that has any chance of forming a government is actually suggesting that that be done. Because the same people that control the banking system control the political system in the global one-party state. There's one other thing I'll talk about before I look at solutions which are very simple, very simple. And that's the microchipped population. That's the one that probably sounds most bizarre, as I said earlier. But it is so close. We're, we're already microchipping domestic animals as a matter of course. The Queen's had the corgis done. Did you see that? Last year, 
She's had the corgis microchipped and linked to a computer. Prince Charles, next you watch. Be. <laughs> sort him out. Funny. The technique that is being used to bring in the microchip population is another major mass mind manipulating technique. I call it the stepping stones technique. And a very good example of that is the European Union and what they have in America, um, the North uh, American Free Trade Agreement, which is a free trade area, which is where the European Union started out, if you recall, and also what's happening in another free trade area in the Pacific Australia area known as APEC. The idea is to have the world government and the bank and all the rest of it and the next stage down from that will be the European Union, the American Union which will be this North American free trade area right the way through the Americas from North to South America, in the, an, an American version of the European Union and a Pacific version of it, they will be the three next stages down from the world government. And the stepping stones technique is how they're being introduced. If you take the European Union, if you started out at the end of the last war, and what we're heading to now had been suggested, one bank, one currency, centralized control of a super state, understandably, I know what my father was, would have said who fought in that war, Excuse me a minute, can I just have a quick word here? We've just spent the last five years with 55 million people killed and uh, many more severely injured to stop that happening. And you're asking us to do it without a bullet being fired. You must be joking. Go and have a cup of tea. So, what the stepping stones technique does, although it knows where it's heading, it does it in stages. It gets away with what it can get away with, first of all, and then starts to move it along, and it presents every step as independent of all the others, so you don't see the pattern. So what was suggested after the last war? Not a European superstate, because that had no chance at that time. It was the common market, just a free trade area, ladies and gentlemen, nothing to worry about. And by the way, if we don't join, we starve. Little problem like that, you know. <laughs> well, we'd better join then, I guess, you know. <coughs> so... Suddenly, some of the states of Europe start to fuse their economies together in a free trade area. Now we're in the web. Because it's uh, suggested very strongly that if anyone pulls out, there will be a economic chaos, certainly in the short term. So now we're in the spider's web. So the process then starts of evolving a free trade area into a European centralized superstate. And... First, we have start having commissions which start dictating to nation states. Then we have um, talk about uh, the central bank. And w interestingly, you know, one of the things that was put forward uh, to justify the one currency was the currency chaos in Europe. Like when the pound fell out of the European monetary system after the government had spent a colossal fortune trying to keep it in there a few years ago. Well, you know, this currency chaos, one, one currency, we'd sort this problem. Interesting, therefore, that the person who attacked the pound and caused that chaos was a frontman for the House of Rothschild called George Soros, a world currency speculator, George Soros Bilderberg Group. The chancellor at the time who spent all that money and eventually pulled the pound out of the monetary system of Europe, was Norman Lamont, Bilderberg Group. Now, when I was talking in Sweden just a few weeks ago, I was talking about this, and some member of the, uh, the audience in Sweden came up and said, I couldn't believe it when you mentioned that guy, George Soros. He said, what happened in Sweden, he said, was um, before we went into the European community, um, all the opinion polls were very strongly against going in. He said, then this guy, George Soros, Bilderberg Group, started attacking the Swedish currency. The Swedish government tried to defend the currency under the prime ministership of Carl Bildt, Bilderberg Group, and eventually chaos ensued. And a great fear started to go into the 
Swedish psyche of, oh my goodness, we need protection. What's going on here? We can't stand alone. Even speculators are taking our currency apart. After that, the opinion polls for going into the European community flipped to the majority saying yes, and in they went. So now, stepping stones, we're now in a situation where we are light years away from what we actually joined. <coughs> stepping stones. Only now are some people saying, excuse me, have you seen how far we've come? It's interesting that um, right along the line, as the stepping stones uh, are put forward, anyone who uh, uh, challenges the stepping stones is then um, manipulated into continuing the journey. I was speaking in Denmark um, at the time I was uh, in the Swedish area also, and what they did was had a referendum which voted against Maastricht, against the European Union. They then had another referendum, not long afterwards, which then said, yes, we'll go in. And as one national newspaper editor in um, Denmark said to me, he was told by one of the big pro Maastricht people in Denmark, we're just going to go on having referendums until we get the result we want. That's how it works, because we are in the land of the free. So that's the technique, and it's being used to bring in the microchip population. And the big stepping stone to that is the cashless society. Coins and bits of paper might not seem to be a great defender of freedom, but they are for this reason. If you go into a shop now, or a, um, a garage or whatever, and you hand over cashless money, electronic money, a credit card, they put it through that machine. And they say sometimes, well, I'm ever so sorry, the, the computer won't accept your card. And if you've paid the bill, you might be a bit surprised, but you've got an alternative at the moment. So you say, oh, well, okay, I'll we'll have to check that out. Okay, I'll pay cash. What happens when there's no cash and that computer says no to electronic money? your credit card or the microchip that is planned to replace it. Suddenly, the computer is deciding, or whoever uh, programs it, what, where, and if you purchase. That's the idea. And if there's one thing in all this that is most important to reject, in my humble opinion, it is microchipping of people, because the implications are enormous. Some electronics people who've seen this sort of thing emerging have started to speak out. I've been reading some stuff um, by a guy in America called Carl Sanders, an electronics wizard, and he's pointing out that, in fact, he's talking himself about his own experience of attending meetings in America and Europe attended by Henry Kissinger and the CIA into microchipping of people. Not, is it right, is it moral, but how do we get them to accept it? And as he points out, once people are microchipped, it's not just messages going from the microchip to the computer that should concern us, it's what's coming the other way. According to him, they can create, through this means, mass hysteria, mass depression, in other words, manipulate our emotions, and isolate one microchip in one, peop one person. I got some idea of the possibilities when I realized how Sky Television works. You know the satellite television network we have in Britain? Well, um, if you, um, you want to join the Sky Network thing, okay, you send your money off or whatever, and they send you a card. And it's programmed to descramble the channels you paid for. Very straightforward. But if you want more channels than you've paid for once you've got the card. You would think, well, I did anyway, <laughs> that you would send them more money and they'd send you another card programmed to descramble the channels you want added to it. No, no. What you do is you pick up the phone and you ring their number, it's in Scotland, I think, and they say, yeah, okay, what channel do you all have that second movie channel, mate? Thank you very much, yeah. Um, and they say, okay, put your television on the channel that you want, all fuzz, scrambled. So while you're still on the phone, they say, um, 
OK, just tell me what's happening to your screen. Only the channel appearing before your eyes, that's all. So I thought, how do they do that? I heard about it, gave them a ring. How do you do that? What they do is they send out a signal from this central, what do you call it, technology, I guess, and it goes to every decoder linked to the sky system, but only your card with your number on it picks it up, it reprograms the card to take the new channel, and it comes up before your eyes. When you think there are two types of science in the world, there's the one that uh, is taught in the universities and appears on the television, and there's another one that is light years ahead, secret science, what they can actually do compared with what we see they can do with things like the Sky Television example are, are vastly, vastly advanced. I wrote a book called The Robots Rebellion and um, I talked about this um, microchip population um, idea. I've already been uh, surprised by the speed of it. I turned on the BBC a few months ago. I don't know if you saw this. It was funny. Tomorrow's World. You know the science program on the BBC? They had this item on microchipped people, see. What they said was, um, there's this problem with health records. I thought something must be done then, I suppose. <laughs> the problem, apparently, uh, was that they don't keep health records for long enough. So they're suggesting microchipping people with their health records to overcome this problem. Now, I never went to university... but I can actually see a solution to the problem of not keeping health records for long enough. <laughs> Keep them longer. There you go. Let's all go and have a cup of tea. That's that sorted out. No, no. No, no. No, that's too simple. We've got to microchip people. The other thing they said was that um, doctors would like to have access to medical records if people have an accident. So microchip them. So, takes things on. I don't know what, about you, but when I was a kid, my mother was always saying to me, you have clean underpants on our Dave, you might have an accident. You ever get some of that? Yeah. <laughs> my mother's worst nightmare was not um, me having an accident so much as me having an accident with dirty underpants on. That was her worst nightmare. <laughs> but all these years later, we've moved into the modern world. Now it's, you make sure you're microchipped our Dave, you might have an accident. Anyway, in this item, and I checked the date, it wasn't April Fool's Day or anything like that, they had this woman um, who had had an operation and had been microchipped with her medical records. Oh, it's ever so convenient, she said. I'm eating the cushion in the front room by now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens? You know in the supermarkets, <coughs> they've got that thing they put across the barcode? Doctor walks into shop with one of them. Rubs it up her front. <laughs> Up on the screen comes this woman's medical records. I thought, I'm going to wake up in a minute here, you know. <laughs> but at the end of the item came the key little clip, not very long, by the managing director of the company that's produced the technology, the microchip. This is just the start, he says. We can put on this chip medical records, financial records, passport details, social security details, uh, prison record, the flipping lot. Exactly. That is the idea. And it's been moving along, unmolested, for a very long time, because its great power is secrecy, and when you think that so much of the mainstream media is controlled by the very force that wishes to bring it about, it's not surprising that so little of it has come out. But I feel we're now in a time of enormous change, a great jump in human evolution, and therefore an energy of change is bringing this stuff to the surface, and its secrecy, its great power is being unveiled. And I certainly don't want to be seen to be condemning the people I have talked about. And, I mean, I've heard some people who've investigated this without the spiritual balance, and they're saying, oh, hang them, hang them, hang them. Oh. Rubbish. The people involved in this manipulation 
are, yes, exhibiting their state of being at this time in their eternal jewel to acknowledge and think about. I, I don't talk about the Carringtons and the Kissingers and the Rockefellers with hate in my heart or um, condemnation. I just think we ought to know what's going on so we can stop it going on. Because what I've just described is actually a massive statement about us because it can only happen because of us and the fact that we have conceded our right to our own power and our own control of our own lives. And I'm going to talk a, for, for a, a little while about something that may seem to be totally unconnected with what I've talked about so far, but it is actually the reason it's possible and it is the reason that we are the generations that are in the process of removing this nonsense and turning this planet from a prison to a paradise, which is what it really should be. When the top of my head um, exploded and this awareness uh, started appearing in my mind that challenge both religion and this world is all there is science. I heard this line, we create our own reality. And I thought, yeah, that sounds right to me. But there has to be a means through which we do it because there is no such thing as the paranormal and no such thing as the supernatural. They don't exist. Everything that happens in creation is the result of the natural laws of creation and the interaction of energy. What we call the paranormal and the supernatural is merely that which the system wishes to push away. Because, again, I, the, the, we, I have this word I use sometimes, oposames. Oposames are people and organizations who appear to be in opposition, often appear to be uh, extreme opposition, but actually they're just the same attitude to life with a different dress on. I love the far right and the far left. I love that one. The far right, as symbolized by Adolf Hitler, is into centralized control, military dictatorship, concentration camps. The far, far left, as symbolized by Joseph Stalin, the absolute opposite to that, is into centralized control, military dictatorship, and concentration camps. Yeah, great. It's great to have choice in the world, isn't it? And oposames also applies to religion and science. Because they appear to be in opposition, but in one way they're exactly the same. They both survive only through the suppression of knowledge. What we call science, which I understand comes from a Greek word meaning knowledge, and much of our science is an insult to the word knowledge, because it's not about the pursuit of knowledge, it's about the defense of a belief system. You know, it's just another religion, science. Instead of having the dog collar and the long gown, they have a white coat on. It's still the religion. Open-minded science, now that's different, that is in pursuit of knowledge. And more and more, the spiritual and the open-minded scientific are speaking the same language, and that's the way we're going in this decade and beyond. But at the moment, mainstream science is defending a belief system. So it has this law of physics on which it's all based. And this law of physics says, this world is all there is, we're a cosmic accident heading for oblivion, life's a bitch and then you die. <laughs> Cheers, that's great news, yeah. Thanks a lot, mate. Yeah, it's really good, that. Um, so... Anything that is experienced by people outside of this has to be explained away. Now, it could be explained away by the fact the laws of physics, as we have come to uh, be told about them, are actually fundamentally flawed. But no, no, hold on. Them physics, they pay my mortgage. They give me my status in life. You know, they give me my credibility. I'm, I've been saying all my life that's how things are. I mean, well... So therefore, I've got to explain that away, because all these people keep having near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences and stuff, sir. So. Do you know I've got it? It's the paranormal. It's the supernatural. It's as natural as the air we breathe. And it's in that area, I believe, that we find how we create our own reality, and through that, create the reality I've been talking about so far tonight. For me, an increasingly open-minded science... Everything in creation is the same energy, and e energy is consciousness. They are the same thing. So the energy that is our minds and our emotions and us is the same energy that is every blade of grass and every insect and every tree and every breath we take. 
every drop of rain. Just as water, clouds and ice are the same substance in very different states of being, so everything that exists in creation is the same energy consciousness in different states of being. We are like droplets of water in an ocean of consciousness. Unique and individual, yes, but together forming the whole. We are each other. I am you, you are me, I am everything, and everything is me. Same with everyone. And this gigantic, infinite mind we call God, or whatever name you want to put to it, operates on multidimensional frequencies. It's interesting, because of the uh, influence of religion, when anyone talks about kind of the afterlife, we look up, have you noticed that? <laughs> on the flaming roof or something, I don't know. Want to go to heaven? Get a ladder. You know. <laughs> but for me, and increasingly open-minded science, um, creation is actually broken up into wavelengths, frequencies, sharing the same space. All the radio and television stations broadcasting to this area are occupying not just the space around my body, but the space my body is occupying. We're on different wavelengths. Therefore, one radio station, unless it's very close in its frequency to another, operates in complete oblivion of all the other wavelengths. Everything that exists in creation is sharing the same space that our bodies are occupying and our minds are occupying. What is that line we hear? The kingdom of heaven is within you. Everything that exists is within us. So when our consciousness, thinking, feeling, emotional us, that part of us that is eternal, enters the physical body, the genetic spacesuit as I call it, to experience this physical life, this three-dimensional frequency, world, dimension, we are not a blank sheet of paper. We are already unique. The unique sum total of all our experiences. And I've noticed this with, with my boy, um, Jamie, who's three now. Because uh, my mind's been open to this in the period he's been alive, I've watched him develop. And he has manifested his own unique character, what he finds funny, what he finds fearful, all these different things without any outside influence because he wasn't born into this world as a blank sheet of paper he was born unique we're all unique this uniqueness is broadcast out as a magnetic electrical pattern for me everything that exists is magnetic electrical energy so when people talk about hands-on healing you, you get it's the devil Or, bloody strange, mate, load of rubbish, mumbo-jumbo. What is hands-on healing? It's not faith healing. It is the passing on of electrical magnetic energy from one person to another. It's kind of interesting. I was reading a book recently called Where Science and Magic Meet, which was showing the scientific basis of the so-called paranormal, and it was pointing out that of the 285 standing stone circles in the United Kingdom still remaining, 235 are on the same types of rock, and they're all on or close to faults in the Earth's surface that produce a certain electromagnetic field. Because the ancients didn't know what they were doing, did they? You know. Because we're state-of-the-art now. So we're putting out this magnetic pattern which is unique to us. It is our sense of self. It is our sense of reality. And there's an American comedian um, called Bill Hicks who summed up my whole attitude to life and everything really and what I'm talking about here in a wonderful line. He said, matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is just a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. And that, for me, is the key phrase. We are the imagination of ourselves. What we imagine ourselves to be is what we create as a physical experience, second by second by second. This... Um, 
magnetic electrical pattern going out. We call vibes. You know, we have everyday um, expressions and words for this. We say, oh, I don't know what, what it was about that fellow, mate. You know, I had a nice conversation, but got bad vibes from him somehow because the voice to ear uh, conversation may have been quite pleasant, but there's something we're picking up on a, on a subatomic uh, energy level which doesn't sink. Get bad vibes, mate. We have a word which we use all the time, atmosphere. What is atmosphere? Atmosphere is the energy field of a room that has been turned to be negative, exciting, or positive, or happy, or whatever, by the thought patterns, the vibes, the imagination of themselves, of the people involved. People go into an old house where there may be a lot of negative events, or they go to a, uh, the site of a, a, an ancient battle, and they go, ooh, tell you what, mate, ooh, it's eerie here. Ooh, don't like it here. Something about it. We're picking up the energy, negative in that case, that has been created in that state by the vibes, the thought patterns of people who have gone through negative events there. Atmosphere, football matches, sports occasions. You could touch the atmosphere mate the excitement was amazing what is excitement what is this atmosphere it is what people generate on this vibe level so as these vibes we're putting out these unique patterns are the uh, are magnetic they are pulling in constantly other energy fields which we know better as people places ways of life experiences in this way second by second we are creating as a physical um, event, physical experience, an exact replica of our subconscious imagination of ourselves in the people, places, ways of life we experience. We are creating our own reality. When I look back at my own life um, from this perspective, it is amazing that whatever my physical experience has been through my life, it has been a replica of my imagination of myself at that time. Until relatively recently, I was angry, seriously angry. I didn't know why I was angry, but I was angry. I now kind of looked at it, I realized I was angry about my childhood, angry about my father, but I was angry. My life through that period was a series of angry confrontations. Um, because even if I was in a bar or in a room and um, I was kind of physically appeared to be relaxed, got a drink or something, my anger is still going out as a vibe, even though I appear to be quite relaxed at the time. I tell you, anyone who'd had a bad day, I got them. Anyone that was feeling a bit wound up, I got them. I was having, they were, I was the person they picked out in the room. And my, my life was a series of angry confrontations, which created this kind of cycle. I got angry, I got, felt guilty for getting angry, which made me more frustrated, which made me angrier, which made me have more confrontations, which made me feel guilty, and so it went on, down. And after a while, I thought... <laughs> Hold on a second. Do you know there's one common theme between all these angry confrontations? And it's you. What gives? And I started to look at myself in a different way. I realized that I was angry because most of us are and we don't realize it. And I started to whoosh, let it go. Interestingly, just acknowledging the anger often lets it go. And I started to like myself. My goodness me! You're not supposed to do that, have you? You're not supposed to love yourself. It's actually um, a, a form of um, putting someone down. Oh, he loves himself, he does. <laughs> you can't love yourself. You've got to be humble. Oh, and, and it's kind of, a, it's a term of, um, of praise now, isn't it? Do you know, he's ever so humble, you know. He's always putting himself down, but he loves the world. No, he doesn't. We can only love out there when we love in here because we can't give out what we haven't got. And we are pressured all the time to feel bad about ourselves, to have a limited imagination of ourselves. Therefore, we create a limited um, physical experience. When I started to let this anger go and like myself, love myself, oh my goodness, call the police, my life changed. 
because so I started to respect my right to be me and not what other people were insisting that I should be to conform to some mythical right and wrong. And once I started having that feeling about myself, I started to attract into my life people who love me, not for what they want me to be, but for what I am, whatever I am is. And that's just a reflection of the way I see myself. I am creating a different reality. Friend of mine, lovely, lovely person, but, and I hardly exaggerate when I say, she starts virtually every sentence with the words, the problem is though, this lady sees life as a problem. Her life is a series of problems. So I said to, said to her, last time I saw her, what's up? She said, you, you, don't, you don't look too, too happy. She said, I'm fed up. She said, I'm useless, me. She said, I'm a useless wife. I'm a useless mother. I've got no ability. I've got nothing to contribute. I'm useless, I am. Fed up. I said, well, what's brought this on now? She said, well, I'm, I'm fed up. She said, everyone's putting me down. I thought, no, no. You are putting you down. Your imagination of yourself is that you are useless. And this lady is surrounded by people in her life who are constantly putting her down. And she's pulled them in because she has created her imagination of herself as a physical experience. One of the great w ways this works is we attract to us what we most fear. Because fear is not only a great controller, the great controller of the human race, it's also the great limiter of human evolution. Because whatever the area we fear um, relates to, we keep out of there, don't we? I mean, we don't kind of go in there and think, oh, I'm going to sort that out. We go, oh, no, I'm going over here, thank you very much. So what we do is subconsciously bring that in so we face it and move on. When I was a kid, I was terrified of dogs, me. Terrified of them. I lived in this big council estate in Leicester. It was over here. Over here were the shops, and there was a bit of green between them. You know, like a common, you know? Whenever I walked across that common, I'm surrounded by them. <laughs> rope, 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 jumping up at me, and oh my... God. What do we say in those circumstances? Why, I'm so unlucky, me. Of all the people for it to happen to, it happens to me. I go to my mate's house. Uh, my mate um, had this really docile dog called Prince. I walk into his house, he takes a bit out of me, coat this thing, you know. <laughs> my mates go across that green, they're not frightened of dogs. The dogs completely leave them alone. And when I'm a kid, I'm thinking, I'm so unlucky me. Why me, of all the people for it to happen? But what I was doing was pulling in what I most feared to face it. As a result of walking through and facing that, I'm no longer frightened of dogs. Interestingly, um, the, the, I say until re relatively recently, the things that probably terrified me most were um, going to the dentist, um, flying, and speaking in public. <laughs> and being ridiculed. Which has never happened to me, has it, in this country, you know? My worst nightmare would have been having a tooth out on a plane while making a speech to the laughing passengers. That would have done me in that. But as a result of facing all of those fears that I've just said, I don't fear any of them anymore. Because fear is our creation, it's a choice. We, choose, we can choose to fear or not to fear. So this process of putting out our imagination of ourselves and pulling in a physical reflection of that is at the heart of the human experience. And the most destructive state of mind, and my goodness me, we've all been there, it's possible to be in, is poor me. The victim mentality will always reproduce the victim reality. This world is awash with victims because this world is awash with people who are being conditioned to see themselves as victims, powerless, under the control of somebody else. Therefore, they create that reality. And we've all been there, as I say, but for some it becomes a, like permanent squatter's rights in the psyche, the victim mentality. Um, and it doesn't matter how you 
um, fuss around and run around um, someone who's in victim mode. Poor me, you know, someone else is in control of my life and they must do something about it. And, oh, God, I'm ever so unlucky. doesn't matter how you try to help someone like that. They'll always be in victim circumstances because the vibe they're putting out will constantly pull in that physical re uh, re reflection. The change, which is why vision is so important, the change that gets the victim out of that situation is to realize there are no victims. Only states of mind that perceive themselves to be victims. The moment we say, hold on a minute, hold on a little, I'm not a robot, I'm not a clone, and I am certainly not a victim. I'm in control of my life, and I'm going to get out of these circumstances that I'm in at the moment, because I've created them, and I'm going to get out of them. At that point, the vibe changes. So what it pulls in changes. Suddenly, people get bits of luck. An amazing coincidence has happened. You'll never guess, mate. It was ever so lucky. That guy came into my life at just the right time and helped me get out of that circumstance. I can't believe it. Not luck at all. Creation by a state, change state of mind. So if we are creating our own reality by our imagination of ourselves, this is at the heart of how all that I talked about in the first half actually has been created and is allowed to continue. What are we bombarded with throughout our lives? Messages about limitation, about the fact that we can't do this and I can't, I could never mentality. A fear of experience because so much experience is denied to us by people saying you can't do that, you shouldn't do that. Religion has bombarded the uh, psyche with born sinners. Great start in life, that, isn't it? <laughs> so we're constantly being hit by this limit, sense of limitation. I can't, I could never, I'm frightened to. So we have a limited imagination of ourselves. I remember I was brought up on this big housing estate, and I was kind of um, conditioned to believe that because um, um, I was like, working class, that my life was basically sorted. Because there were two types of people in the world, there was us and there was them, and as I was an us and not a them, that was fundamentally um, important and at the heart of where my life would go. I was born working class and I'll always be working class. Not planning to, move, to evolve then. No, no, no. <laughs> Limitation, limitation, limitation. And it manifests itself in this great line. The ordinary man and woman in the street. <sighs> I don't know about you, I have never in my life met a single ordinary man or woman ever. All I meet are extraordinary people. But we are conditioned to see ourselves as ordinary, ordinary man and woman in the street, I've got no power. Therefore, we play that part. We read that script. We act out on the movie of life, this three-dimensional holographic movie we're part of here in this three-dimensional world. We play the part. And therefore, we live that reality. The limitation of I can't, I could never, I'm ordinary. So we set up the circumstances in which those who see themselves as ordinary can be manipulated by those who realize the game. What I've sort of seen in this hassle-free zone that I talked about at the start, the hassle-free zone is also a pyramid. I was, um, I was kind of... Um, interested to be invited um, last summer to the memorial service for the British comedian Larry Grayson, who I, I knew quite well for a short time. Very funny man. Something was said at that event which really sums up what I'm saying. Larry Grayson alone was a unique man. 
because the man who left the dressing room was the man on the stage when the curtains opened. They weren't two Larry Graysons. I remember him saying once, Anybody watching this kind of video in another country, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an idea of Larry Grayson. He, he was, um, he, he was on, I, saw, I saw him once on a stage, he said, oh, he said, you know, he said, you know, last week, he said, I was all stiff down this right hand side, he said, you'll see you. Ooh. He said, you know, this week, he said, I'm all stiff down this left hand side here. He said, I can't wait till next week, can I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's got it, look. Anyway. That's Larry Grayson, great guy. Another comedian, Roy Hudd, told a, uh, did a presentation of Larry's life at this memorial service, and it overwhelmingly took the form of a story that Larry Grayson had told him of something that had happened when he was going around the variety halls of Britain years and years ago. And Larry was saying that he was in this all-male show, see, and there's one woman in it, and that's Larry Grayson dressed up because he used to do that sort of thing, you know. And he said the producer of this show, he says, was very patriotic, he said. So the big finish was Rule Britannia, you know. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. Pass the sick bag, you know. And um, actually, I said that in Portsmouth the other week. Didn't go down well at all. Really. <laughs> anyway. Um, so what they had, this big finish, Rule Britannia. And he said what happened was all the men came on dressed as sailors, started singing, you know. And then, as the music built up, they all got in each other's shoulders on the stage and they formed this pyramid, leaving a flat bit at the top. On walks Larry Grayson then, dressed as Britannia. Long gown, sword, shield, helmet, you know. And he gets manhandled up the top of this pyramid and he's on the top there. Roar, Britannia, for the big finish. Well, as Larry Grayson said, one night he said, Things seem to be going rather well, he said. Then I noticed, he said, that the sailor in the bottom left-hand corner had got rather a cough, he said. And he came out with a great line, he said, and as any ancient Egyptian will tell you, that is a rather important point on the pyramid. <laughs> so, this guy's, this guy's eventually coughed his guts up, hasn't he, you know? And he's fallen out of the pyramid. So what's happened? The stage is awash with tumbling sailors. Larry Grayson, apparently, is in someone's lap in the second row. <laughs> oh, hello, dear. How are you? All right, yeah. Now, what has happened here? Larry Grayson, symbolic of the few who control the planet, has not done anything. An ordinary man and woman in the street has got a flaming cough. And the whole thing's come down because we have been conditioned to forget where the power lies in a pyramid. It's not up there, it's here. But because we think it's there, we have created that physical reality of a pyramidic system. Um, people say, oh, those people, that, that elite, that global elite, they're very powerful, aren't they? No! The power that is used to manipulate the human race day after day is merely the power the human race gives away day after day. That's all. So there we are in this hassle-free zone pyramid, right? And everyone's on everyone else's shoulders and these different levels in the hierarchy of society. And each level is saying to the one below, don't you move, you stay where you are, I'm depending on you. You know, if you, if you walk out of there, the whole system will be collapse, it'll be chaos, there'll be, oh, hunger, and oh, it'll be terrible. So, oh, all right, I'll just stay here. And each level of this pyramid, everyone else is terrified into stepping out of it and getting a cough because they're terrified of the consequences of not being in this prison. And at the top of this pyramid, being held up by this fear, are a very few people who are passing down through the different levels the messages they want the whole pyramid to accept as reality. Like um, anyone who's not uh, into religion or science is into spirituality and metaphysics and seeing uh, that, that we are actually 
very different to what we've been portrayed as, you know, we're not slabs of meat, we are multidimensional consciousness. Right, well that's a problem, because if we th realize their multidimensional consciousness in control of their own lives and destiny, that means we can't control them. So therefore we must persuade them that's uh, right. Okay, that staff, pass it on, it's the devil! Oh, all right, thank you very much. It's the de oh, it's all devil, you know, they're talking about it. it's the devil, you're Satan. Or they try the other approach, they're off their rocker! Oh, yeah, oh, they're bloody mad, you know, they talk about, oh, yeah, pass it, oh, yeah, oh, that, no, oh, I think so, yeah, my, my mother told me, yeah. And the other thing they pass down, on which we all pass on, you are free, you are free, pass it on. We're free, oh, great, we're free, honey, pass it on, we're free, oh, we're in a democracy, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it's great, we're free. Don't need to cough. Because we're in a democracy and we are free. But what are they actually saying, this freedom? They're actually saying, you are free to watch Noel's house party. <laughs> For people in another part of the world, that is an insult, an intelligence insulting program in my humble opinion, but never mind. They are saying, you are free to watch the National Lottery live and contribute to the latest form of taxation in this country. You're free to do that. You're free to watch the gladiators knock their flipping heads together. And Dallas and all this other stuff. You're free to watch all that. You are free every year to have more and more dots on your zapper button and you're free to press any one of them and have your intelligence insulted by 99% of them. You're free! Oh, thanks. But you are not free to say what you really think without hassle. You're not free to be what you really are and express what you really are. You're not free to live your life as you see fit if it is outside the manufactured norm. You're not even free to live in one house and pay to live in one house. You have to buy three. Three things for me would change all that I've talked about tonight and make it impossible and would turn this prison into a paradise. It doesn't take one new political ism, not one smoke filled room, not one terrorist freedom fighting organization. What a contradiction in terms to change this world to a paradise. It just takes each of us to be who we really are and to express that uniqueness. It needs us to get a cough and step out of this nonsense. Those three things are to respect our own right to be unique and to express that uniqueness. Crucially, to respect everyone else's right to be unique and express their uniqueness. And thirdly, that no one ever seeks to impose what they believe on anyone else. At that point, this, we'd have a great explosion of human potential being unleashed from the prison of fear where it's spent so long. But because no one seeks to impose what they believe on anyone else, free will is not denied. Once we respect our own right to be unique, we cease to be a slave to impose thought and behavior. Once we respect everyone else's right to be unique, we cease to be a police force of the hassle-free zone and all the other slaves. And if we don't seek to impose what we believe in everyone else, no one's free will is denied. And what a difference that would make. If you take the symbology again of the herd of sheep. Hundreds of sheep across that hillside. Farmer arrives and the pickup truck gets out, stands there on the stick, wagging the uh, eyelids. One or two or three of the sheep start to walk towards him. But now, the sheep mentality is very different. The other sheep are not following the one in front. They're celebrating their uniqueness, they're following their heart. They're expressing who they really are. 
So they're saying, that's interesting, old Fred and Ethel Sheep going over to that bloke on the stick, that's interesting. Do you know they do that every day at the same time? Very strange. But me, no, my heart, this is right for me. I'm going over here, I'm told it's ever so good, you know, there's a lot to learn over there, a lot to experience, that's where I'm going. And the other sheep says, oh, that's good, I'll have a word with you later, see what went on. But I'm going there, and I'm going there. What on earth does the farmer do? Because now it is mayhem from his point of view. Because the bar bar mentality has disappeared. And all the other sheep are saying, you have every right to go over there. As long as you don't interfere with me, that's great. Same with you, same with you. So the farmer might at that point, symbolic of this global clique, he might then fall back on old faithful. We'll frighten them to death. Get them flipping sheepdogs out. Row, 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 row. And now the same sheep that are expressing their uniqueness, because they're now in their own power, and they know that they are infinite in their power, because there are no ordinary men and women in the street, just extraordinary people, because they're in their power, they realize that fear is their creation. And fear may be stimulated out there, but we choose whether to fear or not. Nobody else. It's just a choice. Everything's just a choice. So, it's, excuse me, Go and have a bowl of water or some dog food or something on your way, not interested, not going to be frightened into conforming to what you say I should be. All that's happened in that example is that the sheep have let go of fear. They have let go of fearing being what they are unique and the whole situation has changed. And if you bring that into the human experience, everything that I've talked about tonight becomes impossible once we express our uniqueness and stop condemning everybody else for expressing their uniqueness because it differs from what we think they should be doing. And for me, we are the front of the snowplow generations here. There is a, a global awakening going on that's changing the nature of people's perceptions of life. You know, when I, when, I look, when I look at people, I see them standing symbolically in an eggshell. Inside the eggshell is that very narrow area of our consciousness that we actually operate on in this three-dimensional world. And that very narrow area, first gear as I call it, is a doddle to manipulate by messages hitting us through the eyes and the ears constantly. Outside of the eggshell is our multidimensional consciousness, not some other external entity, our own multidimensional eye going on into infinity. An infinity of love, understanding, wisdom, knowledge. Because, you know, people say, you have to seek enlightenment. I don't agree with that. Enlightenment's never gone away. Enlightenment is sharing exactly the same space as ignorance. It's just on a different vibration, that's all. What I feel, my view anyway, we need to do is not seek enlightenment but remove the barriers that are keeping enlightenment out and that is the eggshell an eggshell made up of fear guilt resentment lack of self-esteem I can't limited imagination of ourselves fear and when that starts to crack and it's cracking for more and more people multidimensional self starts to get access to reconnect with first gear self. And at that point, we start to perceive ourselves and life very different. Symbolically, I feel that what's happening is there are vibratory changes going on around the planet as a natural course of human evolution, which are cracking this eggshell, this low vibrational energy that is our prison. And so the light, if you want to call it that, the multidimensional self, the infinite self, is starting to get in and reconnect with this self. Suddenly, and I, God, I get two or three thousand letters a year now from people of all walks of life, increasingly from around the world, and the same experience is being experienced by all these different people. And that is, they're saying, I'm seeing myself in the world very differently. Why haven't I seen it before? It's so obvious. Because now the eggshell's cracking. And it's not first gear that's making the perception process in this world, it's multidimensional self. We're becoming whole again. We're becoming what we really are, but have forgotten we are. The front of the snowplow generations 
are taking from our parents and grandparents, not because they're bad people, because they're just passing on their programming, we all do, which are basically about run with the, run with the herd, don't cause trouble, keep your head down, and as the Japanese uh, have a saying, don't be the nail that stands out above the rest, because that's the first one to get hit. Love that one. <laughs> and we're passing on to our, not just our children, but to ourselves, because this is a really here and now thing, thought patterns that say, you be you, whatever you is, and respect everyone else's right to be them. And the people between that and that are our generations. If we can let go of our own fear, we can remove fear from the world. Because the world is merely the sum total of human imagination of ourselves. When we change our imagination of ourselves, what we call the world dramatically changes. The world is just a second by second physical replica of the human mass imagination of ourselves. When we let go of our sense of limitation, our sense of fear, our sense of I can't, the world ceases to be a prison because we have created it. There's a, a wonderful uh, singer in this country, a German called Gila, who, um, it's a lovely song, which goes, we are the power in everyone. We are the dance of the moon and the sun. We are the hope that will never hide. We are the turning of the tide. If we can turn the tide within ourselves from freedom or to freedom, from fear, then we turn that tide outwardly in the planet. And all it is, like everything else, is a choice. A choice between fear and love. That's all it is. We can choose to be frightened. We can choose to hate. It's a choice. Or we can choose not to fear and we can choose to love. Not love on the basis of I love you if I fancy you, darling. But I love you because you exist. I love you whatever. I love you without condition. And if we want to change the world, it has to start with self. Fear, anger, hatred, condemnation, dictating what other people should be. That's the world we've got. That's the prison. But paradise is waiting. It's a thought, an attitude away. That's all it is, a choice away. Love. If we love each other and love the world, our lives are fundamentally changed and the world is fundamentally changed. And we are the generations, strange as it may seem when you survey the world today, we are the generations I passionately believe who are going to love the world into the paradise it really should be and was always designed to be. Changing the world is not something in the future anymore. Oh, I hope it'll be better for the kids. It's here and now. We're going to see it happen. <coughs> Another song, the chorus of which I'll finish with. Love can build a bridge between your heart and mine. Love can build a bridge. Don't you think it's time? More and more people across this planet are screaming yes to that question. And we are the generations who are going to love the world to a paradise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.